I first came to uh, visit Frankston in October 1947, when I was here on a merchant ship visiting. On the Sunday, they had a big bus and they would load us all in the bus and with picnic hampers and they'd drive us down to Portsea for a, for a picnic. <laughs> Very nice. And uh, we stopped in, uh, in Frankston uh, to have a drink because it was the only place on a Sunday outside the, uh, the limit from Melbourne that you could have a drink. But my next visit it was when I migrated with my wife and daughter in uh, June uh, 1959. I saw this job advertised for a salesman in the furniture electrical shop it had just been built. So I came down on the train and when we got off, it was a 40 degree day, by the way, and, and the bush flies were in plague proportions all round us, you could hardly see. And as we were coming down the ramp to get into Young Street, they stopped us. There was this big film crew all around. <laughs> All of a sudden, these big fogging machines came in and they filled the street with white fog you couldn't hardly see and choking to kill off all, all the flies. When, when it's all cleared um, on the loud hailers, they were telling us to stay there, we'll give you the order, you charge across the road. And there was Ava Gardner and uh, Gregory Peck and Anthony Perkins and Fred Astaire do, doing a little routine tap dance on, on the side, so they said, Right, charge! And we <laughs> moved across. Stop us. No, they didn't like the take. Go back three times we had to do it, and I was going for an interview, and I was two hours late. My name is Towers, Dwight Lionel Towers. Really? Really. Well, hang on, Dwight Lionel. Hello, my name is Glenda Viner. I am president of the Frankston Historical Society and we run Ballon Park Homestead for Frankston City Council. I've been in Frankston since 1960. Um, I've lived in Keringle for 38 years and prior to that I lived in William Street in Frankston. So I've always been at the center of what's happening in Frankston and I absolutely love it. After World War I, we had a, a group of uh, French soldiers, of course. They were given uh, you know, a slap up sort of afternoon tray by the locals. Just thank yous, I guess, for what they'd done um, you know, to fight with, with the Australians uh, and New Zealanders. All the old cars were there. It was sort of quite a big celebration. And, and those times you have to remember that people had had enough. They'd been through a war, the First World War, and they'd had enough, so they wanted a little bit of gaiety, I think. Frankston became the arts colony. Keith and Elizabeth Murdoch uh, came to Cruden Farm. Uh, the Lindsays came out to Mulberry Hill. Uh, Harry and Nan McClellan, brother and sister, came to, uh, to the beach. And of course, Harry bought 40 acres out here at Lang Warren, which became McClellan Gallery after his death. Lots of the famous artists came, you know, McCubbin, all the, all the famous artists of the day. Later on in the 20s, they wanted to, uh, to have a little bit more enjoyment. Lots of dancers went on the village, as Frankston was in those days. They all got together to do things for, for different celebrations. Everything, you know, I mean, the, the Scout Jamboree is a good example. It started in December 27th, 1934, and it went through to the 13th, January 1935. This was the biggest deal out, and the town of Frankston wasn't a town, it was a little village. In the first six days, 62,000 people came to Frankston. Imagine catering for, for 62,000 people. They came from all over the world, India, Africa, you know, England. My father was a scout leader and he came to the Frankston Jamboree and it was quite interesting that the Jamboree wasn't only the first 
held in the Southern Hemisphere. It became a world jamboree because of the centenary of Victoria. Well, they were in a tent that would house about five or six young people. I suppose in one way it'd be like a huge army camp. A lot of them built their own gateways, depicting from where they came from and the many languages spoken, but they had the common language of scouting. Baden Powell did come, he was the founder, of course, and uh, really welcomed the invitation to attend. Because he was, wasn't a very tall man, and he wasn't very young at this, uh, this stage, he always rode on a white horse. Because I got to know the young, young scouts that went with my dad, and their tales from that time were really, really great. It did have a, a lasting effect on them. Uh, it, it started the, the regrowth, I think, uh, of Frankston uh, for the few years until, until World War II happened. And then, of course, you know, you're back to where you started again. I was carried in my father's arms at six months of age to Frankston, where he was about to start a medical practice as a young doctor. Uh, my brother was three, and we settled on the corner of Fiocchi Avenue and Nepean Highway when the Avenue of Honour still existed. Then the war intervened and Dad went to war. At that stage, Mum had been left some money and she bought a cottage on Gould Street. And the interesting thing about Gould Street then was that uh, it was full of children and most of us were fatherless because our dads were at the war. We swam and we lit bonfires on the beach until our mum screamed at us and said, come on in, it's dark. And we helped the fishermen pull in their nets and if we pulled hard and there was plenty of fish, we got a fish to take home to our mums. It was a wonderful childhood because we were safe, we were greatly loved and we were free. I arrived in Frankston when I was about two years old, so I'm told. And uh, uh, from there, well, I lived in the middle of Frankston until the 50s. One of my earliest memories was with my father. So I would have been about six years old. Uh, he worked for Davies Bakery, uh, which was situated on the corner of Well Street and Young Street and uh, he used to deliver bread to all of Frankston. We'd do that way before lunch and the other way after lunch. Uh, I can recall even going uh, as far out as Dr Vincent. That was about the outskirts of Frankston at that stage. I have been in Frankston all my life. I was born in June 1938 at Max Welton before the hospital was built here in 1941. I grew up in Bay Street, which is now Nepean Highway, up until I was about 10. My mother had a business in Bay Street. She had the Athens Cafe there for 20 years until 1958. There were lots of dances around town. There was the Masonic Hall and the Soldiers Hall. A lot of the young ones used to come in and have supper after the dances. And other people used to come at interval from the picture theatre in Plain Street, which was the old Plaza Theatre, which is now a deserted building. I was born in Frankston. I'd married Bill in Frankston, and we have lived in Frankston ever since. I have been to Melbourne on shopping trips, but that's, that's about it. You know, I can think right back to when I was about five or six, when the Frankston Beach was our backyard. We played there all the time. We would be down there until my mother had a cowbell and she used to ring it and half of Frankston went home for tea. They'd hear her cowbell. Where I was living it was off Beach Street, Frankston, and um, the roads were not made, of course, there. They were just sort of sandy tracks. And um, all the children of the neighbourhood got together and we, we were like an adventuresome seven, you know, we all went out together. I went to Davy Street School, the 1464, 
and um, we just loved it there. But it was a long way away from East Frankston. But later on, when, when we did have a bus service, it was an initiative of, of a couple, Gil and his wife, Alice Banting. She was the bus driver. So that was something, oh, the lady's going to be a bus driver. So um, we, we enjoyed that. Sometimes we'd deliberately not catch the bus. We'd, we'd walk home because we'd walk home bef behind the road roller. You know, we're doing the roads and that was exciting. It was something we didn't have to pay for entertainment. We just walked home behind something like that. When I used to go to state school here at Frankston and Davy Street 1464, I used to walk different ways. Sometimes I'd go up past the Grand Hotel and turn left and go, and other times I'd go into Thompson Street, which was very wet and muddy, and I'd see the blacksmith across the road, the soldiers' hall on the right, and we'd cross into Plain Street, and then we'd go up where Arthur's Dairy were. They had a paddock there with the horses, and we'd go through the paddock, and we'd go over to school that way. We found all sorts of interesting ways to get to school and to come home. I used to uh, time my going to school in sometimes, not all the time, but when they turned the engines around to face the other way, which was quite interesting. They, the steam engine guys used to let out quite a bit of steam at the finish, and sometimes I was even late to school. <laughs> At my grandmother's place during the war, we all gathered around together to listen to the wireless. I remember as a child, they were talking about the guerrilla warfare. And as a child, I thought, oh, isn't that terrible? All these big apes fighting together. I didn't know there was a, a different meaning for a guerrilla warfare. With our school, we had to have, uh, um, at certain times, when the siren went, we had to go out and go into a trench down in Beauty Park. Practice runs and, uh, you know, we all got bitten by bull ants. Everybody had to be, uh, had to have their windows blacked out. Uh, the, the air raid warden came around in his tin hat and inspected. And if you had a small chink of light, he'd knock on the door and get that fixed. Well, the Marines lived at Balcom and they used to come in and we used to have the shop it was only about three or four and I'm sitting at the counter on a stool and he, this Marine said something to me and he, I looked at him and he said, I'm pulling your leg. And I looked down to see if my leg was being pulled. That was how innocent I was at three or four. I went down the peninsula where the Americans were with a girlfriend one day. We'd walk right down to the beach. And after all, she said, I think there's something wrong. So we got up and we're very, we practically run up the hill by, oh, thank God, he said, out, get out of the gate quick. And he practically pushed us out the main gates. And I said, what's the matter? He said, there's an Indian seaman with smallpox and that's the ambulance that he's in. And if he, if he comes through and you're on this side of the gate, you'll be here for a fortnight. So we shot out the gate and uh, when we came home, I rang him up and I said, what happened? He said, oh, he said he had chicken pox, not smallpox. <laughs> there were so many Australian and English soldiers and sailors transported to Japan and in prisoner of war camps in Japan. Some prisoners were forced to work in the coal mines in Japan. Dad became terribly ill and he could see the Red Cross dropping crates of bully beef socks, fruit cakes, but more importantly than anything, the letters from home. And Dad stood up to the Commandant one day and he quoted the rules of the Geneva Convention for the treatment of prisoners. And he was beaten to the ground with bamboo poles and every time he fell to the ground, they propped him up and beat him to the ground. But the end result of that was that these crates were released to the prisoners of war and to get letters from home was magical. And it, it kept them sane. Dad discovered in amongst these crates of goodies that um, there was yellow sulfur drugs for tropical ulcers, and there was quinine for malaria, all tropical diseases, and there was a strange white powder. And 
He didn't know what it was, but he found it more efficient on the tropical ulcers than the sulfur drugs. So he used it. When he got home, he discovered its name was penicillin. And it had not been named before he went to war. I mean, we didn't see our father for another six and a half years. I didn't know my father until I was seven. A lot of our soldiers went there to rehabilitate Japan and they came home and many came home to Frankston with Japanese war brides and he treated them for free. He held no grudge against the Japanese. He said it was a dirty war. At the fall of Rebel on the island of New Britain, he didn't flee. He stayed with his soldiers and the wounded and he trawled and marched them through the jungle and he walked towards what he knew was there at Massawa, a Catholic mission. And the Catholic missionary there wrote up about this huge man dragging hit the wounded, some hanging onto his belt and others under each, one under each arm through the jungle and who refused even a cup of tea until his men were settled. That's what he was like and he was still like that when he came back here and he worked for the community all his life. He was gruff and grumpy. He was awkward socially, but he was decent and he was a bloody good doctor. It wasn't really until, you know, uh, after World War II that it started to take off more. Um, and that was because uh, the government um, had housing for p return servicemen. Karingal was opened up. Before that, it was sort of farmland. Everything had to be new and everything had to be recovered from after the war. When Central Park was Central Park, it was, it was really nice. It was just paddock with the, li with the library in one of the corners that, that surrounded the paddock and the preschool sat there uh, on the edge, right in the middle of it. Our biggest treat was to stop and watch the blacksmith. Arthur's dairies were still delivering milk by horse and cart, and they used to shoe the horses. But it used to be a, um, a Cobb & Co um, uh, way stop for going down, down to Portsea. Yeah, I remember seeing Graham Kennedy because I knocked him over one day. Didn't mean to, but there's a, a, well, it's still a place in Well Street where the dentist is upstairs and you come down a flight of stairs and there's the doorway and you step straight out onto the pavement. And I'd left my baby in the back of the car and I knew Bill had gone off to look at something and I thought, oh, she might be howling her head off. So I run down the stairs, jumped out and knocked Graham Kennedy over. I, I don't say he fell full length, but he did a sort of a, a dance across the footpath and ended up in the gutter. <laughs> uh, we sold our shop and Coles came. It brought more trade down to that end of Frankston. Sometimes in the afternoons when it was quiet, we'd go down to the beach. I would go to the Well Street Beach, whereas other people went to other beaches. Some of them went to what they called the Long Island Beach. And others would go to the Fernery Beach, was opposite the Fernery. Where there is now a Caltex garage, there was the fernery and it was also a boarding house and it was run by, I think there were two sisters and it was very, very popular and it was very genteel and ladylike. On this particular day, about six of us hoed into this shop a couple of doors down from the ground to get a hamburger. And at the end of the end of the shop, there was a man stood there in an overcoat and a trilby hat. He turned around to walk out and, and we all went, uh, mouths dropped open and it was Harold Holt. But we used to see Dame Elizabeth a lot round shopping round Frankston, Dame Elizabeth Murdoch. She would uh, park her car and I was, I'd be parking my car on the top of Ball and Welsh's. She was always say hello, she's such a lovely person. I've always loved living in Frankston and, and I've never wanted to move anywhere else. Um, I, and I think a lot of the older people feel like that. I, had, uh, I hope I get carried out of my home with my boots on. I don't, <laughs> I don't ever want to leave here. And yes, I'm, I'm very happy to be a Frankston art. Yeah. It's what you make it. I, I met someone who was applying for a Frankston City Council job. 
he was in a business suit. He was walking along the boardwalk and he was leaning over the edge of the railing and looking up at Oliver's Hill and down backwards towards uh, North Frankston that way. And I spoke to him and I said, oh, what do you think? He said, I can't believe it's, you've kept it such a secret. It's a magnificent place. And that's, I agreed with him.